to see what happened at the first funeral where a great matriarch in Israel passed on. And this is when we lost our beloved matriarch Sarah, Avram Avinu's wife. And it's interesting to note what Torah tells us there about the funeral procession and service. And Torah tells us, Vayovo Avraham lispoid lesora velevkosa. That Avraham Avinu came to eulogize Sarah and to cry over her. And I asked a very simple question. After all, was this the place for Avraham Avinu to speak? He loses this great partner in life who uh, was by his side from the very moment he began to introduce monotheism into the world and to travel and to go far and wide to tell the world that there is a God. How is it that they didn't bring in anybody else to deliver a hostage? I know in America when somebody, God forbid, dies, you hire a rabbi. And the nicer things he says, you pay him more. I mean, this is part of the business. Now, in a case like this, I'm sure there must have been other people there who could have spoken about, uh, said some nice things to please uh, the world and to please uh, Abraham. Why does Torah tell us by Yobo Avraham? The fact that Torah tells us that he himself, as broken up as he was, came to uh, eulogize his wife, there must have been a reason. But my dear friend, the answer to that may be that Abraham Avinu knew that there was nobody alive on earth who knew his wife like he knew her. And no matter what anybody would be able to say about Sarah, it would never do justice to her because he knew what Sarah was. He knew the sacrifices that Sarah brought. He knew the son that she left behind. And he knew the mark that she made on uh, that generation and all the generations to come. Nobody, and I say this very advisedly, has the ability to describe our beloved Rebetzin. The only one who has that capability is our beloved Rebbe. He had her for 60 years. This was his gift from heaven. You know, I'm not as young as many of you think I am. <laughs> but I remember when the Rebbe came to America, and I'm going to tell you a few of the things. I was his first caddy boy. I was the first little American kid who hooked on to him. And I used to go into the America's office. At that time, it wasn't like it is today. It's still his office. But those times, he used to sit on the left-hand side by a desk. And uh, I used to run his errands. The Rebbe used to be my speechwriter. When I took my pulpit and I needed a speech, I used to call up. I was invited to deliver a siyam on shas. No, I was a young Schmendrick. I know a Siam on Shas. I learned Shas. I know a couple of things about the Gemara, but I didn't know Shas. So I used to lift up the telephone. Hello? Rabbi Schneerson? He said, yeah, what's that to you? I said, it's that for my Siam of Shas. So he used to say to me, Nemta pencil? <laughs> he didn't say, call me back in 20 minutes. I got to look something up. He said, Nemta pencil? I got new Siam. I brought the house down. I became a speaker. When I delivered that scene, woo, they said, See, and now I'm telling you some of the secrets. I got an invitation from a shul in Brownsville. Those days, they'd like me to come to see him Mishnayis. I learned some Mishnayis. But I went through Shisha. So I called Rabbi Shneis. Yo, Yankel. Your boss is Rabbi Yankel. I took a pencil. I still got some of the notes. I still say, say some of the things. He, he, I, I wasn't smart enough to write everything down. And he told me which form to buy for my library when I became rabbi and what to use for my brushes and so on and so forth. Anyway, 
I used to be his caddy boy. He used to come into the house all the time. I was a young guy, you know. We're going back now over 40 years. And the rabbi, she used to watch me. And I was, I wasn't a fashluf ningle, you know. I used to, I used to go. No, there was no monkey business with me. I never had time. Even when I was wrong, I didn't have time. Now I truly don't have time. Anyways, I used to come in. So the Robertson used to grab a glass of juice and run after me. I said, Robertson, don't worry about me. I'm doing okay. And I ran off like a thief. You know, she was a great human being. I don't know if you know this. Whatever I tell you is factual. This is not dream stuff. The Rebetzin, throughout her married life, never went to bed before the Rebbe came home. You know what that means? Who remembers when Yechidish used to end at five in the morning? She would stay up and wait for him. And she would say, Ich weiß, as mit in so she used to stay awake. But how could you stay awake? Listen to this. What a Rebetzin can do. So she used to have a friend that she used to call on the telephone. And she used to talk for two, three hours. So she shouldn't fall asleep. Until the Rebbe arrived. When the Rebbe arrived, she said good night, And she took, she went to the Rebbe. I don't know how many of you ladies wait up to see your husbands come home. <laughs> there was a woman you've got to hear these things you, know, you, you, you don't think about these things there was a woman who went into labor she went into labor and she was friendly with the Rebbe and she notified her she always used to have hard deliveries so she notified the Rebbe that she's going into labor she had the baby a day later so the Rebbe called her up and he said, Du weißt, ich mit mein Mann hab nicht geschlafen eine ganze Nacht. Man hat gesagt wegen dir. Would you believe that? She with the Rebbe stood up, concerned why they don't hear yet that the baby was born and that everything was okay. Where do you find such human beings in the world? Now we're not talking about headlines in the New York Times. Nobody knows about this. There was a young lady who needed an apartment and wanted an apartment in a certain building. And there were a lot of people who wanted the apartments in that same building. You hear this? So the Rebbitson used to call the landlord and she used to tip off her husband that anybody who wants that apartment, he shouldn't say yes. <laughs> and the guy saw two months went away and he didn't rent the apartment. So that girl got the apartment. This was the Rebbitson. Hanukkah, Hanukkah, you hear? She used to have kids who used to come to her. There were certain families who were close with her. This is a very simple family. I tell you, when this guy told me the story, I, I had an inferiority complex. I thought I was somebody. And they used to go here with his six kids, God bless them. And they used to come to the Levitin for Hanukkah. She used to go throughout the year. Anyway, he has a daughter of 12 years old. A very thrifty kid. And they went to the house, and they were supposed to meet the Rebetzin. It so happened, that day of Hanukkah, the Rebbe came, this was his last Hanukkah. The Rebbe came home a little early. So what happened was, she went upstairs with the Rebbe, the flight upstairs, and she left word downstairs with the attendant that when this and this family shows up, she, he should apologize to the family, why she couldn't be with the children. And to tell them, that she prepared all the candy and the dreidla and the Hanukkah girl, and she should forgive them. So the 12 year old said to her father, when her father asked her, are you disappointed that the Rebetzin isn't here to see us? So she said to her father, she said, Daddy, as far as I'm concerned, the Rebetzin, to be with the Rebbe for one minute more is worth to me, the whole business that she shouldn't be with us. So the next day, 
This fella calls up the Rebbe. And he tells her, you know what my daughter said? That you should be with the Rebbe. One minute more was worthy to her to give up the pleasure of being with you as long as you should have another minute with the Rebbe. So she said to the father, you tell your daughter that from now on she never needs an appointment to me. She can come into my house whenever she wants. For she understood the Rebbe's heart. Rabbi Kramer Zalzangesund mentioned about the Fabrenians. My interpretations that I used to do, my translations to the Rebbe into English. A very strange story. Arab Yom Kippur, you know, we go for Lekha. No. So I go for Lekha, and this is, of course, two days after Vav Tishrei, after the oversight of his mother. He was, he Fabreng, that Vav Tishrei. I did the translation over radio, and then I came to get the Lekha. When he, tur- he, he gives me the lecker, there are about 10,000 people out there. He stops, talks to me. He gives me the lecker. He says to me, Erased. As much be ribbig again. As dos mo. What he had received is of. As he wound about them for bringing. As if it's given. Ois he given the free alamo. No more to be so. He had to fahus. I caught. So then, isn't all right? Episode of the other. The mail that I. The Rebbitson told him that I happened to have cough back in, at the, in that translation. But look how she picked it up. She heard that I gave her cough. So she already told the Rebbe he should check me up if I'm doing all right. I said, no, no, Rebbe, I want to get out of the line as quickly as I can get out of there. You know? But this was the Rebbe. Just let me tell you one other thing. The Rebbitson, 12 years ago, bought candlesticks for a collar. Immaterial who the color was. Somebody who was close. A week before she left us, she called in the husband and said to him, You know, I gave your wife the candlesticks, but I never gave her a tray to put the candlesticks on. And she took a silver tray from the house and handed it to him and said, Give this to your wife as the completion of the wedding gift that I had to give her when I gave her the candlesticks and let her have the tray now also. This was one week before she left this world. This is what I'm going to tell you tonight. There is so much that we all could learn from such a great lady. I am not worthy enough. I am not capable enough to be able to describe the aristocracy, the royalty of this woman. It just doesn't go in language. You just have to be, be, be lucky to have met this person to know what true royalty means. And let me tell you, when the Rebbe lost her, he lost the greatest friend that he had in this world. And we're going through now, all of us, such a terrible era of brokenheartedness. It's only because we feel what happened to our beloved Rebbe. If only we knew a way how we could console him, how we could comfort him, how we could uplift his spirits. I tell you, I'm sure that everybody would be ready to do that. But there too, I'm in a very serious puzzle. I just don't know how to do this. I think and I talk and I search and I try to ponder. I haven't found the answer yet. I'm only praying and hoping that after this relation, things will come back to normalcy and that once again, the devil will get into the swing of things until he completes his job to bring us Mashiach Tzitkenu. My friends, this is as far as I'm going to go in at my preface. You know, George Bernard Shaw once said that preaching could be one of four things. Some preaching is like wine. It has color, it has sparkle, but there's no permanent good. Some is like Drunk, like drinking coffee. 
It stimulates, but it doesn't nourish. Something is like carbonated water. It's a fuss over nothing. And finally, something is like spring water. It's good, but it's hard to get. I'm going to just share with you a thought tonight and try to see if my voice and heart that I bring to you tonight cannot stir up the excitement and the enthusiasm about this beautiful experience that I just lived through. The signing of an agreement to build a third floor on the Beth Rifka schools. Now, you know, we are now between Purim and Pesach. Rabbi Minkowitz was telling us that he didn't have a chance to masquerade on Purim, so he put on the hard hat today, and he was the Purim dick. I'm going to leave a thought with you for Pesach, if I can. And let's see how quickly I can do this. You know, when the Torah says, the Chocha Tochlu Oso, this is the way you should eat the Koban Pesach, the Paschal Sacrifice. And Torah goes on to enumerate Mastechem chagurim, that your loins should be girded. Naalechem baraglechem, you had to wear shoes on your feet. Makelchem beyetchem, you had to have your walking staff, the stick that you walk with. And the chaltemotem is a puzzle, eat it hurriedly, because it's a Pesach Lashem. Now I asked a very simple question, I'm a very pragmatic guy. I asked the question, what is this at this? Since when does Tehra have to teach me how to eat? That's a new one. What do you mean how to eat? I know how to eat. With a fork or with a knife. I'll be a mensch. That's the way you got to eat. Why does Teza have to tell me that it has to be Mosechem Chagurim? Why do I have to have my, 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 my gird? I have to be girded by my loin? Why must I have the Alechem by Glechem if I want to be comfortable to wear a pair of slippers so I'm not allowed? What is this effort? Umakelchem the Yemchem. Whoever saw anybody sit and eat with a stick in his hand, I don't understand this business. Evidently, if Taylor takes time out and space to tell us how we are supposed to eat, there must be a message there for the young of a Pesach. And let me share a thought with you. It seems to me that what Torah is trying to tell us, listen, you must remember that the message of Pesach has to penetrate into the hearts and minds of every single individual who observes the yont of a Pesach. What do we mean when we say gird your loins? We're speaking here about children who come from our loins. And Torah says to us, you have to tie your children to yourself. You have to make sure that your children don't drift away from you. You have to make sure that your children don't get swallowed up in this cesspool of a world in which we are living today, with the pornography, and with the permissiveness, and with the intermarriages, and with the cult, and with the AIDS, and with the drugs, hold your kids tied to you. We find that when the Malach had a battle, the uh, Yaakov Avinu fights with the angel of Esau. What does Torah tell us? The Medrash says, he was wrestling with this guy all night, with his Asa of Arosha. What was Asa? First he comes to him as a Talmud Chochem. You hear this? He's coming to Yaakov Avinu as a Talmud Chochem. And he comes to tell Yaakov Avinu that his way of life isn't so right. And he looks like a holy sage. And he starts talking like somebody in Bnei Brak. And you may really make the thing that this is the real stuff. This is the real McCoy. And he's trying to sell a bill of goods to Yaakov Avinu. And Yaakov Avinu says, listen, mister, you can be dressed as a Talmud Chochem, but you're not speaking Emes. You're not speaking the truth. So he comes, uh, says the Medrash Ka'akum. He comes like a boy. Here he goes another way. And he uses another approach altogether. Here he says, listen, the only way you're going to get away out of this world, safe and sound, is if you will assimilate. you got to need Yekachol The only way that you're going to do it. Yaakov Avinu tells him to get lost. And he keeps wrestling with him. Finally, what does he do? Torah tells us, by Yaakov, he hits him in the hip. What does he say? Okay, Yaakov, you I couldn't get, but I'm going to get your kids, God forbid. Here comes Torah, and Torah says, 
You have to tie your children to yourself. Laban Horachami, that bandit, when he was running after Yaakov Avinu, the father of the sweetheart of a guy, comes to Yaakov Avinu and he, what does he say to him? Habonim Bonai, the sons of my son. Habonus Bonosai, the daughters of my daughters. What is he? In other words, listen, father, you can go on your merry way, but I want my grandchildren to live the way I should live, says Laban Horachami. Until Yaakov Avinu made him understand, he caught the wrong guy. It's Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu does not capitulate. And finally, we take a look what Pharaoh did. Pharaoh, he was busy taking the Jewish children and uh, pushing them into the mortar, drowning them in the world. Showing them what a great world there is out there. And telling them being a Jewish kid of Beis Rivka won't give you the opportunities to be able to do what everybody else is doing. This was Pharaoh's way of life. When it came to go out of Mitzrayim, you know what he said? Lechuno hagavolim. Let the men go. Go ahead, fellas, you go. He wanted the girls for himself. He figured simple. If he'll kill the Jewish daughters off, if he'll poison them, that will be the end of the Lakhlal Yisrael. That's the answer to the enemies of the world. That's the answer to the Pharaohs, to the Levins, to the Hitlers, to uh, the UN. And uh, even to my liberal Jews. Then it comes the Aleichem Baraglechem. You have to wear shoes. Now you got to understand something. You know what the Gemara says in Pesachim? The Gemara says the following. You hear this? A man should sell whatever he possesses and he should buy a pair of shoes for his feet. Well, it's a nice thing. You got to walk with shoes. But take a look what happens further. When Moses is brought to the burning bush, what does God say to him? Shalmi Allah, may Allah throw your shoes off. What is this? Here he should sell whatever he got to get a pair of shoes. Here God says, throw the shoes off. Make your mind up. Throw shoes on, shoes off. Which is it? When the Kohanim did their service in Beis Hamikdash, they had to go barefoot. Remember that? They had to walk barefoot. How come they didn't wear shoes? It was pretty wet in there, you know that, with all the blood coming through in the, and the water when they were shechting the golden pesach. How come he didn't tell them to put on a pair of shoes? But my dear friends, there is a basic difference. When you're dealing with holiness, then there cannot be any separation. Then you take your shoes off because you have to have direct contact with sanctity. But when you're out there in this world of ours, with all the trials and tribulations, and all the ups and downs and problems that men, women, and children are confronted with and have to go through, that's the time you put on a protective pair of shoes so that you shouldn't have too close contact. Because if you're going to make too close contact, you can get AIDS. Okay? This is what Torah comes to teach us in modern language. I like to interpret my Torah in my everyday life. Because if you talk to them about something which is abstract, he doesn't know what you're talking about. But when you tell it to him in plain, simple English, he knows exactly what Torah wants to convey to us. So this is where the difference comes in. Now, lechem barag lechem. You gotta watch out, there's a world out there that's very dangerous. You got the cults, you got drugs, you have all kinds of missionaries. You have to be sure that you won't get caught in that web. And the only way that is done is if you protect your children. How do you do that? Base Rivka! That's the answer. The Jewish daughter who was brought up in a school of this kind, that Jewish daughter will bring Yiddish and Nachis to her parents. That Jewish daughter will bring Jewish children into the world. 
That Jewish daughter will give perpetuity to Jews and Judaism. A daughter that is protected with what she learns by her teachers in Meshrifka. This kind of a Jewish daughter will not make the mistake that so many other parents and children have made, which caused never so much heartache and service in the world. Doesn't then. I'm in New York. Much bigger community than Montreal. If you ever walked into my office a day, you'd go nuts like I go. You know what the, what, you, what the problem is? Just listening to all the tourists, case after case after case after case. And why is it? Always ends up with the same story. No education. The kids weren't prepared. The home wasn't right. The kid decided, I'll go my own merry way and do whatever I want. Makel chem the the walking staff in your hand. A staff, this is something that you use for a support. It's like a crutch. Torah comes to tell us the message of Pesach is you only have one support, and that's our Vinu Sheva Shamayim, our Father in Heaven. Those of us who get a nonsensical idea that the nations of the world are our friends. Those who get a chakai, a thought in their mind that we can depend on those nations of the world who sit in that United Nations and 42nd Street in New York, that they are concerned with the welfare of our people. Take a look what happened just recently with the stone throwing. And how did they react? After six million sacrifices, big spill. But what was it? When they killed our million children, who was there to open his mouth and cry out what an injustice was being committed in our civilized world? You didn't hear the voice of anybody, not even the United States, not even Mr. Roosevelt at the time. And today, you fail like a mice. Terrible story. They ambush a bus. No big spiel. So they kill three Jews. That don't mean anything. You touch them, the whole world goes, what's the excitement about? What's going on? What's going on? You have to take your staff and your support in your hands and not depend on anybody because there's no one to depend on. Only on ourselves, as Rabbi Kramer said before, the achdus, the unity, the oneness amongst ourselves, the concern for each other. What does Torah tell us in the Sedra of Ayakel? It says, Zehadov Hashem. It says before also that God spoke, and again, why does it say twice? But the answer is Zehadov. What the, what the Torah tells us, Moshe Rabbeinu said, when he saw all the Jews together, he says, this is what God wants. He wants all you kind to be together. He doesn't want to have any kind of a differences of opinion. This is not for us. This there was never a time when it was so important to unite all together in one as it is today, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just finish very quickly. It's more than we just think. It's not just a holiday to pass over. It's a holiday for God. This is a holiday that has to spell the eternity of a people. And it's up to us. But it starts off with our children. Without that, we're nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, I sat here tonight. I'm ashamed to tell you that I shed a tear. I did shed a tear when they signed. And what came to my mind was the Zorah HaKadosh, which is brought in Tanya. And one side of the heart, there is great joy. On the other side of the heart, there's bitterness. And I said to myself, this would have been such a gorgeous occasion if the Rebbitson was here, if the Rebbitson was alive. Why did it have to cost such a price before this thing was clinched? I just heard that three years ago this was started. Why did it have to take this kind of a situation. And my heart broke within me. I said to myself, I don't understand. I don't know why things go like this. 
But it's we're not we're not taking the, the occasion. We're not taking hold of our situation. We let ourselves be led astray. We let certain things engulf us, and we lose our whole being. And we get ourselves I don't know what all means and mish and plunge it, and before you creep out to know where you're going, it, it becomes what it became today. And so, my dear friends, what a great, great evening this is. What a memorable evening this shall be in my mind. Mir Hashem, when I get back, tomorrow with God's help, I will have a report for the Rebbe Zolder Zimtang. Maybe I always had a, a way of pepping them up. He always had a way of giving some kind of a message that gave him a little bit of joy. He always got a kick out of the way I write to him. I write to him like his little kid. I don't write to him like the big Chassidim. I don't know how to write that way. I was always his little kid. I remained his little kid even till today. And he begs from me because he knows where I come from. I just want to say one thing to you, ladies and gentlemen. I know that you're going to give money tonight. And I heard your wonderful chairman. These are two terrific guys. Dalvin and, uh, uh, and uh, Sam. Take it easy. I didn't forget yet. Sam. These are two terrific guys, young, blood, and a beautiful, up and coming fellows. Ah, the Machaya. <laughs> and I heard about that bittersweet boy. This guy is all right. He's a, so you can sell for me anytime you want. He's terrific. And then I heard this fella get up there and tell us about a $500,000 mortgage. You know, that, that's said very easily, but I want to tell you, boy, to make that good, you sweat plenty of bullets. But let me just say one word to everybody in this room. Before you write out your checks and your pledge cards, because I know everybody is going to do that tonight, because I think it's a historic evening. And if, the, if those tickets are ready, then I notice that the names are going into the Rebbe. I will take them myself to 770 tomorrow, Mr. Shem. Hopefully the Rebbe will be out of his house and back on his office. The God's will uh, on, on the stage. But let me tell you just one little story. They tell that Sir Moses Montefiore, who was the very wealthy uh, uh, philanthropist, was once invited by the Queen of England to a luncheon. Now, this was for an orphanage. And the way it worked was as follows. The, the, uh, the Queen stood at the gate, and everyone who arrived, she had his name on the list, and she handed him this little list with a pen. And everyone who arrived, the guests who arrived to the luncheon, would put next to their name the amount of pounds they are giving for the orphanage. So, one person gave five, one person gave ten. I mean, that was the average deal of it for a luncheon. What's the big deal? It was nice. In those days, ten pounds was a lot of money. You know? So this is the way it was. When Sir Moses arrived, she gives him the, the list, and he writes next to his name fifty pounds. He hands it back to the queen. The queen takes a look. Now she's stunned. Everybody gave five, ten, nobody gave fifty. So she gives him back the list and says, Sir Moses, I think you made a mistake. And he takes the the chart back. He takes a look. And he sees that there's fifty pounds next to his name. And he catches on what happened here. That he pledged much more than she anticipated. And therefore, she felt he must have made a mistake by adding an extra zero, writing 50 instead of 5. Now, he was in a dilemma. To say that he was right and she was wrong would be an embarrassment to the queen. To say that she was right and he was wrong, then he had to do something. So what he did was, was to add another zero to the 50 and made it 500. And Sir Moses handed back the chart to the queen. And when the queen took a look at the chart, she smiled and said, Sir Moses, I see we both didn't make a mistake. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me the privilege to be with you tonight. Have a kashvin and a and yantiv, and we shall meet at Simchit.